right. Uh, first up, we've got Stephen Corliss. He's a Greek American architect and founder of Corliss Architecture. He is a registered architect with experience at many Chicago firms, including Papa George Hames and SCB. Stephen's passion for design and technology, combined with personal hands on construction experience, is at the core of Corliss Architecture. His company focuses on enhancing architectural design and documentation workflows through the use of emergent technologies such as artificial intelligence and virtual reality. Stephen hosts a YouTube channel called Architecture for Thought that covers many of these topics. Ismail Salut is an architect, BIM coordinator, computational designer, and musician at Park Associati. He is part of the design technology unit, supporting teams to work through complex design challenges using BIM and computational design. He has been particularly involved in exploring AI image generating tools and their role in the design process. Joel Putnam originally trained as a fine artist before earning his graduate degree in architecture, while maintaining a strong interest in computer science, mathematics, and geometry. Throughout his career, Joel has focused on the visual expression of meaningful patterns along with their associated analytical processes. He currently runs his architectural practice, Inference, maintains an academic studio at IIT, and is the chief design officer and partner at Capri Investment Group. Pablo Kobayashi is the director of the Unidad de Protocolos, a design practice in Mexico City with a material development and fabrication subsidiary. His practice and research focus on the implications of digital technologies in different stages of the design process, emphasizing the analysis of the theoretical and philosophical consequences of this new paradigm and its interrelation with matter. Pablo is an associate professor of architecture at the Universidad Iberoamericana, where he developed the first diploma program in Mexico, focusing on the use and implications of digital tools. And finally, Marco Andrade was born in Ecuador with an innate artistic talent and a natural inclination to question the established system, be it religious, social, cultural, or political. In architecture, he always wanted to see its future, being influenced by sci-fi books and film. His fascination with flying cars and cities of the future has differentiated his approach to design from the norm. AI has allowed Marco to explore new ideas and think about the future in a different way. He currently works with James Cornejo in New York through his Insight Design Studio office. He also founded Construe New York, a company to uplift, empower, and educate Latino construction workers. All right, it looks like we've got everyone here. So we can get started. Um, I'm very excited about this most likely to be a very lively conversation. I just want to give a very quick preamble and then we can jump right in. Um, we will be discussing the increasing awareness and accessibility of artificial intelligence or AI and how it is rapidly changing conversations around process and output in the architecture community. There are of course many perspectives on this aspect of architectural practice. So today I'm excited to lead a pointed discussion around five themes pertaining to the impact of AI on architectural practice. Um, so as long as we're all good to go, uh, let's get started. I have my first question for the panel, which is about design process. So this is as differentiated from output. I wanted to start by talking about the behind the scenes part of AI in architectural practice. So my question for the panel is, what are some ways that AI can be incorporated into the design process and how do you see it contributing either positively, negatively, or both? Are we just going to jump in and go jump at it? On in. I know that no one here is shy. Yeah. Okay. No one has that word, um, so. so, I mean, maybe to preface, preface uh, the, the audience to let them know, we've had conversations uh, leading up to this. And uh, yeah, there might be differences of opinions, um, but I think we can all agree that uh, these tools are emerging fast and quick, and a lot of architects and designers are attempting to pull them into their design process but I think there's still a lot of confusion in, in exactly how that is happening. Um, so that, that's a kind of a broad question, but to answer it more specifically, there's a couple different areas where it can be brought into um, the workflow and there's design, there's documentation, 
Um, and in each of these categories, this has been happening to some level uh, for some time now. Um, I think Eve, as you mentioned also in the questions or at some, some point we had discussed, um, these technologies such as Revit, you know, at, at one point CAD was new, Revit was new, and now we have these AI technologies, but there are behind the scenes processes like algorithms, intense algorithms that happen in Revit that we don't even think about uh, that are assisting our curtain wall designs, uh, you know, automatically placing mullions and things of that nature. Uh, I think to speak more artistically about it, it really has opened up Pandora's box in terms of creativity. Um, but I'll, I'll save <laughs> what I know we're going to get a little deeper into the philosophy of uh, whether or not that's a good thing. Um, but it, it definitely has allowed for some creativity to, to be rejuvenated, I think, for a lot of architects. And uh, on the more technical aspect, it's given a new opportunity to save time with some of the tools that are coming out for automatic tag placement and, and things of these nature, uh, which again are already in Revit, but uh, they're just getting smarter where the tags aren't overlapping one another. They're actually be able to acknowledge where they're being placed uh, within each other. So I'll leave that there and let someone else kind of chime in. <laughs> yeah, I, I, for me, I think the, the, my favorite part is the research. I mean, I always, I always start with is some historical timeline of place. So simply being able to ask uh, chat GTP to give me a history of something is extremely powerful. Uh, not to say that one wouldn't go and check that, um, but having a dialogue about that uh, is extremely powerful for me. And so, you know, everything starts with, at least for me, with a, a text, something written, as opposed to something visual. So, and, and, it, and it's always very deeply analytical. Um, so whenever I think of, of AI, I don't necessarily think of, of what we currently think of as AI. I, I tip, typically think of um, statistics, uh, quantitative analysis, um, which is to say more machine learning than it is, let's say, AI. Um, so if we're thinking about um, an urban intervention, it tends to be much more data heavy on um, demographics, um, on um, open street maps data, um, and, and applying uh, machine learning techniques uh, to understanding uh, walkability, for instance. And so for me, it's, it's less about the output and more about um, the potential for analytics. Yeah, if I may add, uh, hello everyone. Uh, to me, I think what's really refreshing about those new tools is the, um, they change the way we interact with the computer. This to me is really interesting because um, we're used to um, always feeding the computer with comments and getting um, expecting predictable outcome. But those new, new tools, they you, as Joel was just um, saying, you're having a dialogue with them. So the, the output that, is the, 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 that comes out of those new AI tools is um, definitely unpredictable, which makes them uh, excellent tools for, um, as design assistants for um, exploring ideas. We've got data. Uh, more technical component and ideation. Does anyone have any other thoughts about AI and the design process? Well, I think that uh, the opportunity that this tool, new tool provides to create, um, let's say sometimes an insane amount of iterations of a design options, uh, seeing different types of layouts of arrangements uh, in a short period of time is something that is forcing us to think differently, to mm -hmm. try to resolve the, the, the problems. Sorry, I, I couldn't get into an office. Um, but it's, it's getting uh, much more challenging for the professionals to, to know or to learn how to select or decide the, the best options, because there are so many that the AI provides that it's almost 
too good to be true because we find so many good options that in the past were not possible by just one person or one team doing uh, the standard way, let's say. So do you think this actually is potentially pushing people to sharpen their critical analysis skills um, to how, how you would choose and discern what's the best or better options? Joel yeah, likes definitely. that. <laughs> okay. That's that's Joel's wheelhouse. He's like, yeah, yeah, man. I want I want it to well, be more I, I don't, analytical. I, maybe, maybe not so much more analytical. I mean, I love art, obviously. Um, but the idea that, I, 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 well, I think that this is a some question we're grappling with as a society, right? Especially not to get political, but as we go into the next uh, year, I mean, we're going to see so much so AI is going to be at the forefront of, of politics, for frankly. And so being that, that critical component, I think, is, is very important um, because, you know, and we've said this, I've said this before, and I'd say this often to students, to everyone, it's, you know, computers are really dumb. They, they, they kind of only do what you tell them to do. And so understanding what goes into the tools that we're using really does dictate what, what we get out. Um, and so I think we have to be very critical of, of what is produced um, and how we use it. Um, I don't think anybody on this panel is advocating for a one-to-one -one use of, of an image or text or a 3D model. Um, I still think there is that, that, that part of design that says, okay, this is, this is a tool, this is something for me to use um, in my process. Um, what I do like is that it's continuing this discussion of, of process and, and design and art and creativity is always much more powerful when we discuss process. And so, um, you know, I, I just, many of us have worked in, in many different firms and I think the general public thinks that, you know, it's 50 people working on something, but we all know it's two or three people working on a project. And so having these tools that help us ideate quicker um, and, and, and explore the boundaries uh, sooner is, is, is good. Um, but I think we have to be honest with, with the boundaries, the artificial boundaries that are put upon us by the, 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 the firms that are making these tools. Um, you know, it, 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 it is important to understand that mid-journey is only spitting out a version of what was put in. Um, and so if we are not having a discussion about what goes into these tools, then we simply aren't being honest with ourselves about what's coming out of them. Yeah, I 100% I agree with that. It's definitely, when you say it's forcing us to become more critical of um, the results, it's uh, exactly like Joel said, it's the data sets and the information that we're putting in and our responsibility as architects to curate that data so that it's either customized to what we're knowledgeable about. Um, you know, it, uh, on, my, on my YouTube channel, you know, it's very explorational in terms of uh, theories and how you can use uh, these data sets to promote new um, or, or emergent workflows. And, and one of those is taking data sets uh, internally of you know, an architecture firm or studio, let's say, of details that they're very comfortable with because they work with a certain uh, sunscreen manufacturer, louver system, whatever it is, and they know exactly how this is gonna happen every time. So they have a set of CAD details that they plug in uh, to a large language you know, system. And just like Midjourney, it's able to um, just call, call from this library of details to offer you solutions in certain situations. And you know that's like a plugin um, that, that can be added into Revit, for instance. But to, to lean back on the critical portion of it um, and, and stay more, I guess, for me in, in the philosophical and theoretical and artistic zone, um, what, what this has shown me, like especially mid-journey programs like that, is how superficial architecture either has become or can be. Um, and for young designers especially, uh, it, it's a very important time to stay critical of not falling victim to just replicating designs that are out there that are found on 
uh, Pinterest, for instance, people have likened Midjourney just being an advanced Pinterest. You go on there, you search for you know a beautiful uh, residential tower, organic, et cetera, et cetera, and just like Pinterest, it'll spit out a hundred thousand different images. That's not what's important at all. What's important is having a goal in mind and a data set that you are uh, attempting to refine, curate, and make better, get better yield out of. Uh, so we're optimizing a design based on a goal. It's got to be goal oriented. So I don't I'll leave it to someone else to step in, but it's important I that, think, yeah, go ahead. Thanks, Steven. I mean, I totally agree with both your positions. I think you pointed a, a fundamental part being critical. And I would wish that, that all of this really brought uh, the, prof the profession and all professionals to being critical to their own processes and how they deal with data and how honest was another word that you all brought up uh, a while ago honesty with the boundaries right and 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 that it looks like if we go back to to say uh, similar um tools that have been advancing and then have been adopted in in, in architecture and we know about uh, 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 parametric uh, tools, etc. I mean, we've seen this in in all of the incorporation of these tools, right? The the, the proliferation of it and the standardization of a certain aesthetics, etc. And sometimes having that that aesthetics as a proper uh, uh, goal, which is totally mistaken. And we can see it now also with AI. No, it's going to homogenize and it's homogenizing outputs and bringing a very also. I wouldn't go as far as saying dangerous, but yes, something that we, sh we should be talking and being critical about, especially with, with, with students probably, or, or people adopting these tools that, that it's not the final solution to anything, right? It's how you incorporate it to your process. And if this brings us back to questioning your own process, then it's great. If it doesn't, then whatever you put into the machine, like Joel said, it's gonna spit something similar, right? Um, I'd like to ask about uh, client expectations because you talked about um, final solutions and uh, some sort of seemingly infinite um, outputs. So we talked about process. So now I think what most people who aren't necessarily in the field associate AI and architecture with are just the images that they see. And so uh, have any of you experienced a shift in client expectations or even and I've experienced this with past technologies, clients feeling like, what is your role now when the computer can do it <laughs> for you? Um, and so how do you kind of address those client expectations? Um, and and conversely, <coughs> how can maybe this be used as a learning tool to for firms to drive the process more? Well, I, I think that it has to be as it has always been uh, the expectation managed by the professional um, in our hands is to keep the client expectation real and under control, I'll say. Uh, they can see, uh, I don't know, a thousand of floating houses, but we are the only ones who can tell them why it cannot be built or they can be, I don't know. But uh, it's the same uh, phenomenon that happened in the past when a client comes with a magazine or a picture and say, I want something like this. Uh, and we always had the same opportunity as now and, and a moral, I would say, duty to educate the client and tell them the possible implications of all what they want, financially, culturally, uh, aesthetically. So this tool, and I think we have to emphasize that it is a tool only. Uh, this tool allows us to, to manage in a, in a more broader way the client's expectations we can maybe expand giving our own boundaries or limits uh, but there is always this responsibility of what can be done and cannot be done and how we interact with the client yeah i i would say you know i don't know that clients are actually aware of how architects are using AI yet. Um, because like I mentioned earlier, I'm not even sure architects realize how they're using AI yet um, to their advantage. <laughs> uh, most of what I've seen, um, you know, my LinkedIn feed is just full of 
mid-journey explorations and maybe only a handful of people uh, like Ismail, who is, who's actually looking to push the tools uh, in terms of workflows. Uh, and I'm sure you guys are all doing it as well. Ismail is really good about posting his stuff. Uh, for yeah, public, I think, the, public I think our problem is that we're referring to mid-journey too much. Yeah, there, there's there's a lot of mid-journey references, and you know I've yeah. only used it I think a, a handful of times with clients, and uh, you know the the people it was very uncomfortable to use because uh, the people in the images were dismembered and disfigured. Uh, they called me out on it right away, and you know they're, why what what's with this person? Why is their face all mangled? I go, it's just for conceptual you know and uh it didn't fly so i ended up needing to bring it into photoshop and you know putting you know my own people over it and now photoshop does have a generative fill tool which is pretty good uh, but even then it takes a lot of effort to get things to look right um so you know clients i, I don't think except for uh there is a tool you know i was on a discussion panel for uh university of columbia and the, the professor there was using a tool um basically uh, multi-object optimization and this is where you're allowed to assign characteristics to massing or, or something for a site plan or even for a building in terms of uh, building block massing um, and give levels of importance to to these elements and this is the only area where I've actually seen uh, clients have some semblance of understanding of uh, computational design being used very rapidly to produce hundreds of results, uh, thousands of results, um, which again, we, we get back to, you can have a thousand, you know, foam block cut models I know I'm jumping all over the place, but uh, I remember vis visiting OMA's office and seeing uh, hot wire foam cut models lined up on their desk, uh, hundreds of them. Uh, they're doing a competition. And I go, this is, you know, at, at some point, you're, you have to be fine tuning your critical eye and your set of parameters uh, to, to gauge why you're producing this money uh before you even go that route otherwise you're just you're you're creating an infinite array of options the client doesn't know what's best for them you're, you're not you don't have a material in mind that's guiding the pursuit of your final decision so there's no uh trajectory and these are all parameters like i mentioned for that moo it's it's multi-object optimization uh that can be plugged in to to be used but i don't think we're quite there yet where clients understand that that can be used as a tool uh, to really shave off time in a meaningful way. And I don't think a lot of architects even know how to use these tools yet. These are like students that I saw, um, which comparable in my time were using things like Grasshopper and other plugins to achieve this. Um, I don't think we're quite there yet where clients are able to ask for this stuff in the right way? Um, I think under client, you know, I live in this weird world of academics, practice, and development, uh, investment development. And I, for me, it's the this old adage of AutoCAD and BIM where there is this promise of savior of time um, that I think just gets sucked away from the architect. Uh, and goes back towards the, the, the client side budget. Um, I, I do like the idea of being able to use Photoshop and all the plugins for Photoshop. I think that will help us immensely. A, a lot of time right now is spent in making pretty images, you know, in the dead of night at the last minute. Um, and so I do think that will help us, um, even if they have weird hands. Um, but cautionary tale, um, I'm well, from the development side, I'm working on a project in a loop uh, where we are literally skipping design and using a firm that's using AI. Um, we've decided not to go with an architecture firm or a design firm, um, specifically because the client is savvy enough to know that they can speed this up, uh, you know, despite my objections. Um, so I, I'm 
both elated and fearful. Um, but I think that's that's kind of what happens with technology over and over in our profession. And those that sell, you know, their services as I can save you time, um, great for them. That's that's not I think what anybody on this panel is talking about. Um, and so um, I think we just have to be cognizant of how we position ourselves, right? When Revit came out, everyone's saying, we can save the client money and time and we can get it done faster. Uh, I don't think we should publish that. I don't think we should talk about that. Uh, we should talk about all the benefits of it. And so there will be those um, clients that, that you know are looking to save a buck um, and maybe not save a buck, put a nickel in their pocket. And we have to be smart about how we approach clients with this. Um, I think we also have to be smart about how we um, use this uh, in practice. And so just because we can get 50 images doesn't mean we should ask for 100 or promise 100. Uh, and we've, we've, we've learned this enough with first AutoCAD and then Revit and now generative tools. Um, it's, it's those that are selling architecture that become the problem, in my view. Um, and so we should be smart about how we push back and, and, and keep that precious time to think and to be critical in, in our own hands and not give it away to the client. And, and that's, that's what I hope maybe we've learned, like third time's a charm maybe, <laughs> maybe, I hope. Not based on your example that you just gave. Yeah. You oh, I know. A... No, <laughs> it's, <laughs> their time is not a charm. And I, I think this stuff is just like everything else is going to simultaneously exist in different stratospheres yeah. of, of, of architecture. Um, but, you know, I, I do, I'm not sure, you know, where we're at on time and with questions, but um, I mean, I can't stress enough. I, I guess I went offline a little bit uh, for the past few months in terms of producing AI generated design and, and things like this to really take a step back and assess and see what was going on. And, uh, you know, I had received a lot of comments that it's very superficial what you're producing, these images, it means nothing, et cetera, et cetera. And I agree with a lot of that because, you know, it, it's one thing to, to be form finding and, and discovering new patterns, um, mm -hmm. And it, and it doesn't always have to be meaningful, but at some level there needs to be an assessment and you need to drop back and assess what, what's going on, what's happening. Is this good or bad for the profession? And just, you know, regardless of whether or not it's going to save clients time or money, because yeah, uh, you know, as a business owner, there's some portion of that where it, it, it's saving me time and money too. So there's something interesting about that in terms of the documentation, but I, I'm way more interested in, in what this is doing for architecture architects and the art of architecture um and, and i've said it before and, and i'll say it again now that i do think design is dead i think there is a new genre that demands our attention and architects have been given this role as a character in society we we are typecast into wearing black and 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 you know striving to those late night hours like Joel said and for for these designs that are not groundbreaking or earth shattering or even you know really pushing society forward uh most of the time and i think what i've seen is it has shown me how superficial architecture can be and how superficial it cannot be, where people are actually using it to push forward, uh, like Joel is mentioning in terms of data analysis and really using the machine learning component to advance optimization, yield, efficiency, sustainability. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll just go on a, a real brief tangent and then I'll hand it off. I mean, you know, even a tool like this can be optimized on a full project to most effectively choose your material, product source, uh, cost analysis, um, digitally fabricate, uh, th these types of things that are not even 
being discussed in terms of the more superficial aspect of it with mid journey. And, you know, I'm guilty of it myself. I did a series of images that was, um, you know, construction of the future and it had robotic arms placing panels on a building, et cetera, et cetera. But how, how is that happening? You know, why is that happening? Is it with uh, recycled aluminum? Is it saving, you know, X, Y, Z amount of material on the project, time, budget? Those are the real things that as architects and designers, we should be designing and focusing on. And in my opinion, not the lavish, twirling, undulating, sinuous architectures that we're seeing on Mid Journey. And, uh, and I used to be a huge, sinuous <laughs> designer, thinking that that was like the pinnacle of design. You know, get your Zaha design built and you made it. And I do have buildings built with sinuous, undulating facades. And, you know, they don't make me happy anymore. I think, you know, I've reached a point where what's going to make me happy is seeing these tools actually applied to make the field of architecture what we keep asking it to be <laughs> efficient and uh, giving us our time back and meaningful designs that are, uh, you know, friendly with the earth and one another and actually are healthy designs for people. So I'll leave that there. <laughs> Ismail, yeah. I think you were going to say something. Yeah, Ismail. Yeah, I, I wanted to say I'm a bit more optimistic than you guys. You and uh, <laughs> really? this is my tongue right now. No, I, I, I'm, uh, I, I see this as, as an opportunity also to set things right for um, like, like circling back to client expectations and uh, toxic uh, culture within the architecture practices where you spend countless hours modeling stuff just because uh, your boss said this. I see this as an opportunity. Things are changing in terms of like the tools that we have, how we are, um, how we think about design, how we approach ideas. So no, I'm definitely, I'm definitely optimistic. So, Those tools are really promising. Like uh, just exploring them for a few months, I, uh, I, I, I can see that there's definitely potential. Right now, they are, of course, giving us uh, way too many options that maybe don't make sense, but. Um, I don't know. Maybe in the future, a uh, combination of uh, fine-tuned fine um, generative AI image generating model and an LLM where you can be able to have conversations with, have a dialogue with, that understands architecture history, architecture theories, uh, that is fine-tuned on a specific data set that you have, will definitely, in the end, uh, assist you within the design process no i mean <laughs> i don't know why it became too dull i'm definitely optimistic about this i, I i'm also optimistic I, i'm less optimistic about the kind of or less interested in like production right because production is always changing yeah. um but i mean can you imagine a, a an actual piece of architecture that you would interact with in the way that you're describing it i mean that would be that would be amazing like I'm the potential for AI of, is yeah. like, like software, to interact yeah. or a building. I mean, I, I, uh, yeah, I love yeah, the yeah. idea. Like I, I have every known gadget at home and I wake up in the morning and I, it, it like my phone texts me and tells me that I'm in the kitchen, right? And it mm -hmm. knows I'm in the kitchen and it knows it, it, it's in the morning. And so I think the potential could be like spatial experience and an interaction with AI in the built environment would be way more interesting than simply form making for me and so like i i can't wait for that component because we know it's coming I'm, I, I'm not interested in that at all i i that that's what that's what that's what worries me about the future is is being embedded in it you know they were now we're seeing the spatial computation and apple's vr goggles and all this nonsense and uh you know i've got children i've got three children under the age of five and we try to keep them off the screens as much as possible um, because we know, you know, that's going to come in their future and they're going to be subjected to it as long as they are within society here. Wait till um, they learn the word hypocrite. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it, it's, you know, you're, you're, you're embedded in the society right now where, you know, right now I've got one, two, three screens uh, with, <laughs> that, I'm, that I'm facing at. And, uh, you know, I guess, I guess what I thought with all this AI stuff was that uh, it would be able to redirect our attention towards more significant um, 
agendas. And I guess Ismail, like that, that's why I'm curious. Like it, I'm, I'm optimistic too, but in more of like a, let's, let's redesign this thing in terms of like our profession. Uh, we've discussed yeah. all, offline uh, and I saw like you're hosting a, a raster mind. I like that. Uh, you know, I, I tried to coin the term raster architecture because we're moving into a phase where uh, if you've seen any of my YouTube videos, I'm attempting to take these designs from mid journey that have some meaning and value in terms of being in touch with the earth, uh, and extract 3d information from them using depth maps. And the goal here is to 3d print based off of these digital mesh geometries, actual, uh, architectural components. So moving the profession away from this very traditional design based on uh, Pinterest, you know, images, um, draft, you know, engineer, construct traditionally into a straight, let's ideate based on a very meaningful concept that's going to move society forward in, in some way, you know, whether we're, we're building with indigenous materials or et cetera and find ways to you know go straight from concept to fabrication and that does take you know for instance what joel was saying um documentation sort of out of the picture so to become you know a revit expert in 10 15 20 years there might be a whole new method of even producing architecture and this kind of opens a whole new bag of discussions in terms of architects i believe have unfortunately become product sourcers. You know, we're, we're hardly uh, the master craftsmen and, and, and designers that we once were um, designing the actual window that would go in and the frame and the detail uh, that would But be... is that not the opportunity for this? Right? It, it is, it is. Let's say we describe, as Ismail would say, you describe a window, right? And then it finds it for you. Like I, I for me, those are the, the key points of interest like the, the scary a, part a, is the finding it for you surgeon, is it it, it, it has an intelligent the history of the window and the materials within the window and like see the, this is where they work i i think it should be i know it should be like a back and forward like it's an, a design assistant yeah. we discussed that before but you know at, at at some point shouldn't the the, the flow well, of thoughts it, be taken offline so that yeah. there is a discussion about the direction of our society and what this window frame should be outside of just the data set that was plugged in because then um, we're just sorry, you know, really sorry to jump in here where I, I just want to be mindful of time and i noticed yep. that, uh marcos had his hand up for like 15 minutes so no. sorry to inter interject but i want to make sure that we get kind of a full spectrum of um insights so marco thanks for being patient oh no problem no i am i am following up the, that conversation. And I agree with, with let's say, uh, the multiple sides that are here being uh, expressed. But uh, I think for the for the audience, for whoever is, is uh, watching, I think they we have to, under, to explain to them that there may be at least two different views of these AI uh, tools. One that is uh, these superficial only to the image generating system or, or AI and other AIs that work with uh, quantities or dimensions or uh, more technical stuff, let's say. And when we work on this, uh, let's say, <coughs> let's call it superficial or just uh, appearance working AIs, uh, for me, one of the big advantages is that we are allowed, as I said in the beginning, to see a uh, myriad of, of possibilities that we will never talk about that. And I will put one or two examples. For example, this uh, word bioluminescent that was being used as, as a trend in, in majority and other AIs, uh, I don't think anyone could have imagined what appeared in those images generated by AI. Or somebody used the word biomimicry or something like that in architecture. And then we saw uh, so many houses, ships, uh, and buildings, um, I don't know, like cabanas, 
done with in, the, in that kind of style, let's say. And for me, personally, I don't mind seeing new things because that is, for me, all these images, all, all that stuff is nurturing my creativity. It's not limiting me. It's not like I see 100,000 of images uh, of high-tech architecture, and now I am stuck on that. No, I take a couple of images, and then I develop those. I, I try to adapt. I try to, to improve my designs based on, on those ideas that I never thought. So that's one side, the one that is superficial, it's just the image. And the other sides, I think we are, sorry, we are working on that and it's probably five years more to get some system that allows us to, to detail, to document perfectly a design or to do something or 10 years. But I think that we have to differentiate on those two, two sides. I think in an earlier conversation, we all had someone referred to the, the AI as just like a team member. I think that's kind of what you're talking about in a way, which is interesting that um, it's just one more input in the team and we have to be the ones to determine what we take from it. Yeah, um, def definitely. I would like to point on the imagination part that, that Marco mentioned just now and, and connect it with the initial comment by um, Stephen when you said that it opened the Pandora's box for, for creativity you know, and rejuvenated some creativity for, for some architects. And I find it quite tricky also slash dangerous that this is dependent on a tool if we're thinking of it as just a tool, right? Like this statement of no one could, could have imagined it. Yeah, I don't like that either. You know I mean, if, it, if it's, I don't, yeah, I don't fully agree with it and I don't fully agree. I think I think in this case, what really gives me a little optimism is that we're having this critical position and, and, and it becomes another layer of the mirror. If it gives us the ability to question our processes and our approach to what we're doing, then that's great. But I do see that it, I think it's six individuals here discussing that and agreeing on that position, but not the majority of people. And I, I see that as a worrisome approach or implementation of, of, of these tools. And if we're talking about also, uh, Stephen, you, you mentioned more relevant agendas, I think in terms of uh, the impact that it's going to have on humanity and everything, there couldn't be a less relevant agenda than just design and generating nice Im images and talking about it in an architectural forum, right? That's totally irrelevant and at the bigger scale and, and the impact that we're gonna have and are already seeing on the species is, a lot more relevant probably. And I think we're very good at ignoring that too. Yeah, I mean, we, we wanna be careful like not to jump into an echo chamber, right? Where we're just being like recycled the, the same content over and over. And that's why I agree, Pablo, it's uh, uh, Marco's comment about, you know, I don't think anyone could have imagined this. I, that, I really don't believe that's true. I think, uh, Ismail, you're a musician. Um, you know, if we can make an analogy in terms of uh, when the sampler came out, um, you know, we were able to take a beat and then chop it and rearrange it. And we came up with amazing new genres of music just built on uh, this piece of technology alone. Um, <clears throat> and even, even today, you know, we're still receiving new types of music based on, on that concept. But still, I believe, you know, putting that sampler on the shelf and sitting down at a piano and orchestrating something from experience and scratch uh, is, is going to outperform something in terms of human connectivity uh, than the sampler would have ever had been able to, to produce. And I'm not arguing that it's not producing amazingly intricate patterns and things like that, um, but, it, you know, it, what? I don't know, guys, I, I, I find yeah. the, like, a sample can definitely be used to produce something uh, uh, that, 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 mm, that moves me in a way. It doesn't have to be a piano, yeah? A synthesizer. Yeah, produces yeah exactly. Yeah, yeah, we go back but, to the but I, piano. I, I do think, I person. think what you guys are getting at is, is a deep understanding of the instrument, right? Like, <coughs> I, I am not musical in any way, shape, or form. Um, and so if I sit down to anything, I, I'm not going to be able to, to, to do what you would do. Um, and this is what I've always said about scripting, about computer, about drawing, about drafting, right? It, it takes a, a deep understanding of the craft 
Um, and unfortunately, right now, I don't think there's a single architect, a single individual out there that is producing these tools uh, for themselves and for the discipline. Um, and that's that to me becomes the problem. I've always said garbage in, garbage out. I've always fashioned myself from a computational standpoint as a quote unquote tool maker. Um, I love Grasshopper, but give me <coughs> Unix or C Sharp or anything any day um, because I think it's more important to make the tools that you use. Uh, my favorite tool is charcoal. I, I understand the process of making charcoal and I understand its limitations and its qualities. Uh, and, and I think that that superficial quality of mid-journey is just simply because um, we don't understand the tool. And I, and I don't think that we should discourage people from exploring it or ex like, you know, I'm an outsider art collector. I love outsider art. And, and, and so I think that we, could, we, can, we can all agree with Marco that I actually agree that, and I love the fact that he said he, he didn't imagine these things. Um, it, it made me think a little bit. Um, because we all approach creativity from different places. But when we're talking about proficiency, which is what we're supposed to be as architects, my biggest problem is, is the tool itself and not having control over the tool. Yeah, but why and do you so think when we talk about, when we talk about taking back the profession, right. um, I, I don't think we take back, like, like we don't take it back unless we, like, like it would be interesting if like I could go into a firm and say, hey, I can, I can like you could sell it to the, the you know, go to Skidmore and say, I can save you, you know, time, but my, my fee is not hourly, it's based on whatever, right? And, and unless you own the tool or you own the process or whatever, that doesn't happen. Um, and so I think that we've got to somehow be a little more critical, but also a little more, um, like somehow we've got to get into the tool part of it. it, it, it otherwise, it, it really is someone else's vision. I, I agree. Yeah, like, like, we can interpret it. I just have a question. Why don't you see architectural practices creating their own tools? I mean, it's... it's I, oh, I know they do. I know they yeah. do. I know they do. But, but tell me, tell me, I mean, how, how would, in order to make a convincing AI model, like, you need to be able to, to you know, like, spend hundreds of thousands of dollars a month. Tell me one firm that can do that, or one individual that can do that, right? Yeah, okay, and so, uh, yeah, totally agree, like, yeah, how do you how do you actually get to that? So, so, and I'm not saying you have to. I'm saying we should understand those tools. We should understand how we put them together, what goes into them, um, and that's how we get past the superficial component. I think. Yeah, exactly. Is another way of, or, oh, don't, sorry, or don't get past the superficial. No, many get stuck in that. You mentioned uh, drafting and the substitution of AutoCAD for a pen. Yep lost so much information in the process while uh, not overlooking the potential of digital tools, right? Which is what split the, the, the digital revolution in two branches, probably. And we're still suffering from that. I, I, I still think we're equalizing uh, all these this tools, AI to those tools. It, it's a very, we know that it's a super broad topic and it's a super, what are we talking about when we talk about AI, right? And, and, and you were emphasizing uh, that Ismail, we're only mentioning the journey and allow or focusing into in that too much. And I think the differentiation of this capacity to make decisions, to take decisions for us or from us, is it's what separates it from other tools, other drafting, other even, uh, uh, I don't know, generative algorithms. I mean, we've been there 20 years already, like uh, playing with those and, and, and incorporating those. This is a different beast, and I do think that we are very, very, very narrow-sighted with the profession. Just uh, 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 I, I don't think it's that much of a different beast. I mean, it's just it's just offloading more deeper responsibilities, which I think again it has begged the question: like, what what were our responsibilities? Where were we in the profession? Like, did we stop mm -hmm. and pause to see like what does architecture become? Uh, mm -hmm. just a bunch of product sourcers. I mean, that's essentially, you know, we're dealing with um, curtain wall systems, metal panels, uh, X, Y, Z, just a few parts that we say that goes together. Uh, and, and now what, we're, we're gonna offload that responsibility to AI again. So yeah. it, it, for me, it's, it's, it's like a question of, you know, what, what is creativity in the first place? Why are we using this to try and be more creative? 
creative yeah, yeah. For, for what you know it, just for artistic capability i mean if that's the case let you know go into music or let's be artists only but architecture is not just art it's art and science and it's the combination of uh you know the architect being the master builder the the <clears throat> basically the the coach of the team to dictate uh you know what's the best most you know the the best the safest the most affordable path forward all these responsibilities that the, that the architect has that what are we going to do we're plugging into these systems to then just tell us uh you know before we know it it's going to become prescriptive and formulaic and there's not going to be uh any better way there's going to be the best way basically uh based on you know the earth and <laughs> Uh, how far things can come from, what's the most efficient uh, radius of gathering materials. Gravity has, you know, it's a set number, it's not going to change. So at some point, uh, th this virtual world and model is going to become so prescriptive I, that creativity... I don't know. Stephen, we're human. We're totally going to screw it up. <laughs> we we will we will find a way to screw it up. I, well, I agree we, with We have five minutes left. Um, I'm not sure if we have any questions i don't see any but i'm not sure that i have access to them so i guess i would just like to ask if anyone has any kind of closing thoughts about um yes okay <laughs> short Fire anecdote but back in 2018 i i, I uh, chaired acadia in mexico and i was telling eve about this because back then i proposed as a title for the conference on the matter of truth and it was a dog whistle and it wasn't allowed so it ended up being a totally decaffeinated version of the title. I do think that's still relevant and the title could still be that. I mean, not truth in this huge uh, existential solution that we're gonna come to because we know we won't, but how truthful we are with what surrounds us and with data. Uh, you mentioned at some point, Joel, data driven and data helping to manage data. It's still a problem, right? How do we approach that and how do we see or not see what we or, or describe what we are really seeing. And it, it, can, it cannot be said enough, this post-truth moment and blah, 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 five years ago, it was uh, uh, like heaven because everyone was being truthful. Now the bar is getting even higher about non-truth. So if this tool or not tool or other uh, uh, thing entity brings us to questioning that and how we deal with the world and how we deal with the physical and how we deal with information, what we show to the client and all that, is, is, is taking upon us, then I think it's a good and probably optimistic opportunity. I'm not that optimistic about it or anything around it, but still, it's good that we're talking about it. Eva, so yeah. some, some people can be um, optimistic, but it just won't be you. Yeah, <laughs> I, there's, a, there, the, there's a question in the chat about um, community-based projects. Um, that I want to, I, well, I think honestly, like mid journey being able to, not everyone is able to create an image. So, so the, so the ease at which novice or, or, or non architects can, can put in their thoughts and get an image back that might represent what they're thinking, I think is extremely valuable to the community process. Um, I think that, uh, and I, I know I say this a lot, but data collection, um, one of my favorite things to do is to ask, uh, the community to write essays, um, and through you know text, understanding text, natural language processing, you can find commonalities in what people are saying, even if they're not using the same exact same words. Um, so I think that in terms of you know gathering large inputs from community stakeholders, um, it's extremely valuable uh, because typically the community process is convoluted. It's post-it notes, it's lip service by public officials. Um, and so, you know, there's an on like one of my favorite things that happened during the pandemic was the fact that Zoom came out and we're doing this, right? Um, and so those community stakeholders that were never available or never had the opportunity to attend uh, a public hearing that may happen at 2 p.m. on a Tuesday because they have real world commitments, um, I think that that changed it. And so I, I see that from gathering input and for allowing others to, to express themselves and their thoughts and their ideas, um, it's extremely powerful. So I hope that answers some of that person's question. 
Um, we've got two minutes left. So does anyone else have any? Yeah, I guess we're, we're doing like sign off, uh, like final words. Yeah. Uh, yes, final words, yeah. maybe on an optimistic note, maybe not. Maybe it's doomsday. No, I mean, I, I'm optimistic. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not doomsday at all. I mean, I'm optimistic in the sense that I think, uh, well, I'll, I'll leave it at this and I'll let the others go. Um, in Greek, there's a word, it's skepsu, and it means to be skeptical. And I, I really think we are at an, a point now, and I like what Pablo was mentioning. Uh, you know, I harp on the idea of truth a lot also, where we are looking to assess, you know, how is this actually being of value to our profession, to society as a whole? Um, you know, how is it going to benefit the, the next generation moving forward? We need to be asking these lines of questions so that we're not simply pursuing something that is becoming a fast fashion type of architecture. Um, so, you know, for anyone listening in the audience and the young ones, or even, you know, young professionals, uh, just be skeptical and mindful and ask the deep questions. You know, how is this actually benefiting what I'm doing? That's it. Yeah, if I, if I have something never goes to... away. <laughs> sorry, Ismail, no, what's sorry. your last thought? Yeah, I have <coughs> thought to say is uh, I'm definitely optimistic about the design part of it. The other parts of it are a bit scary. Yeah. Yeah. I guess, I guess a healthy skepticism then from the group. Yeah, because I mean, it's design in the end that uh, you can throw it away. Yeah. Design. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, I'm, I'm I'm interested in what comes next. I mean, there was parametricism, there was blob architecture. So, like, well, we got a seven years. Extinction left come next, comes new. next. Yeah. Extinction so, uh, is that what you said? <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, no, no. Well, I, to end on. It's it's a solar punk future. I, yeah. It's not doomsday. Yeah, totally. It's... I think we're getting cut off on that note. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. That was really interesting. Yeah, thank you so much. This was an incredible panel and amazing conversation. I think I'm going back home with a lot of ideas and things to think about. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you, everyone. Okay, Randy. So next, we are going to have two different rooms. So after we introduce the different presenters, you can choose a room where you want to talk. So if this is still recording, I hope it captured most of that. Uh, thanks for listening in. Um, this was uh, about the future of architecture in terms of use of AI specifically. Um, a lot of those opinions expressed were of mine and not of the host or the panel clearly, but just want to make that statement. So hopefully uh, I can follow up on this video with some more clarification of the ideas that I was speaking about, especially in terms of design being dead and architects needing to design or redesign our profession with these new tools that we have so that we don't get caught in an echo chamber of data fed systems with the data that only currently exists and is just being spit out and regurgitated and remixed. We want to make sure that we're taking ourselves as designers and architects offline to get in touch with nature, family, and experiences so that we can guide society the way we want, not from a commercialized or a corporate perspective that is going to be or become just uh, the most efficient way of doing things um, in terms of time and money.